Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Joanna Archibald from the Technological University of the Shannon. I'm delighted to welcome you to this, this session this afternoon. Uh, I can confirm after uh, catching up with the speakers earlier, and you will have seen the abstracts on the app, uh, that we have a wonderful session for you. Uh, and the session is entitled Library Support for Online and Blended Learning and Research. Um, uh, the biographies of all of our speakers are on the app as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm very happy to kick us off. And uh, the first paper is uh, from Michelle Breen, Jesse Waters, Peter Riley, and uh, Michael O'Hay from the University of Limerick. Uh, and uh, uh, Michelle Breen is here today to speak on behalf of that group. And the title of the paper is Taking a Lead on Digital Literacy for Students, a Case Study from the University of Limerick. Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Thanks to Joanna for the brief introduction and our timekeeper who will keep us on time. A particular hello to the people dialing in from online, the people who are watching the live stream. So you're also welcome and to the people in the room welcome and thank you. So I'm presenting this on behalf of my colleagues listed here. So Peter Riley, who's here, Jesse Waters, myself and Michal O'Hay who isn't here, presented on this digital skills series in UL for two years. So 2020 and 21 as well. And Louise O'Shea, who's probably here as well and who's on your panel conference committee, was the, the engine behind the PR, the social media, the promoting of the series for two years. So in February of this year, we wrote an article. Jesse, Louise and I decided there was, there was enough information and enough interesting findings in what we did to present this to the new review of academic librarianship for publication. And after a bit of back and forth, the peer review process took a couple of months. As you know, it takes a while. Uh, we were delighted to have it published in February. So we wanted to also give this paper then today as a kind of a summary of the learnings that we had from our experiences, and also given the theme of this conference. So the, the library.now theme really spoke to me and said, library now and library future are really so closely related, given what we've all been through since the pandemic, it, it, I felt it was timely to, to share that research with you. So like our parent institutions, uh, libraries are in the skills business. So we teach, we train, we educate, we empower students to be critical uh, thinkers and evaluators of information and to become great researchers in time. That's the ultimate goal. So like all of the other universities that are here, libraries have a program of skills workshops uh, and teaching activities that they do. So whether that's inductions and overviews, introductions to resources, whether it's some subject specialist stuff, it's all about information literacy. So that idea of searching, finding, managing, using information. So this paper then is about digital literacy, which I would call a first cousin of information literacy, or if you want to look at it in a generational sense, it's the, the grandchild to the, the grandparent, perhaps, uh, digital literacy being the grandchild. So in the same way that our universities, and you, you can see this happening, I saw a new course from uh, MTU advertised during the week about smart manufacturing, creating new digital processes and new digital tools. So our institutions revise their academic offerings all the time. They offer new programs, they offer new courses. The academics that you talk to are busy over the summer, that's why John Cox can't find them in NUIG, because they're off revising their curriculum, making new course um, uh, teaching material, and, and we do the same, libraries do the same, and we need to keep reinventing what it is that we teach so that we remain relevant to the curriculum and to what our students need. So late in 2019, I'll move to the one that talks about the index survey. So I'm not sure if you remember this, but late in 2019, for the first time ever, there was a national survey of students to ask them about their digital experience. So the short name for it is the index survey, and you can download the report online. So there were students, 24,000 students completed it from across the, the IOTs and the universities. And one of the stark findings in the report was that 38% of students said they did have an opportunity to upskill digitally. So that leaves 62% who felt that they didn't, right? So they mightn't have explicitly said it, but there's a clear gap there and a clear void where somebody's got to intervene. If these students are coming to university, there's a quote within the article that, that likens kind of students coming into university and not being told what they need to know technically and digitally, what skills and technologies they're expected to use. That's likened to um, accepting students into an English-speaking university without telling them the English language capabilities that they're expected to have. 
So, uh, so we have this index survey then, which is telling us the national picture in Ireland. The JISC survey, which some of you might be familiar with, is the English version of that. So in the foreword to the 2020 um, JISC Insight survey, Michael, Sir Michael Barber wrote that it is essential that students receive practical support to develop their digital skills, to ensure that they progress academically, as well as in preparation for the careers of the future. So then that led us in early 2020 in UL Library to look at how the library could contribute something to meet these digital literacy needs, these, to fill that gap that was so evident. So the conference theme, as I said, is library.now. And really, I think it's, it's, if you'll bear with me, I'll use this digital tsunami metaphor to talk to you about what I think happened in the last two years in terms of digital as it relates to education and libraries' role in providing teaching uh, to students. So the tsunami then has four phases. So the initiation phase is the first phase of it, where you have a really disruptive event. So tsunamis are caused by earthquakes, major movement of water under the surface. And of course, it's going to lead to something catastrophic. So for me, that feels like the moment when COVID-19 arrived on our shores. So all the way back in March 2020. Phase two then of the tsunami is the split. So if you think about the split that happened in our libraries, we continued to provide those analog services that were so important to people. We had click and collect, we had scan and deliver, and a myriad other services that various institutions provided during the pandemic. The, the other side of the split was the, the journey into the unknown. We'll hear a little bit more about it from um, Matthew and Christina in their talk about the virtual study rooms. But as we ventured into the digital and into the unknown, that felt like something really disruptive as well. The third stage of the tsunami is the amplification. So where the height of the wave increases and you've got this really dramatic um, event going on. It was in that kind of terrifying, dramatic moment that need met offering. And it was in that period that we ran this digital skills series. So it's important to put that in context for you as well to say, if we did this at a different time, it might not work. It might have a very different outcome, but circumstances will always impact on your, your results. So in the final stage then of the tsunami, which I think, I hope we're at the end of it, you'll have, in tsunami terms, you'll have some of the waves will wash against the shore. You'll get a little bit of breathing space to be able to assess what happened, what's gone on. Of course there's damage, but of course there are learnings out of it as well. So the things that, are, that we learned out of what we did and the things that we learned from the pandemic are the, the focus of the next few slides. So that's Professor Hannah Fry from UCL. And I, I'm going to just reference her for a second because it is important as educators and as people who are here at the Connell Conference for two days that we do take that opportunity to reflect. And it's to reflect on the future, which sounds like an impossibility, but the future doesn't just happen. It's a carefully constructed concept. And the things that we do today impact the future. So it is a responsibility of ours to start to think about the future and to start to think about ways we can shape it and ways that we can improve it. Sorry. So that's Hannah Fry. So, so Hannah is an academic at UCL, but there are, there are a group of professionals in our world called futurists. So they would hold this view as well, that the future is a carefully constructed concept. Um, inventors, scientists, entrepreneurs, educators, health professionals would all look for signals and trends in our environment to see what are the things that are happening around us that will start to influence how we live our lives in the future. I didn't bring over my phone, but the iPhone, if I, if I asked you how old the iPhone was this year, I, I certainly didn't know, I had to look it up, but the iPhone is only around since 2007. So you think about the difference that that has made to mobile computing, certainly to our lives, and if Apple hadn't invented that device, and if companies hadn't invented smartwatches and wearable technologies, would we be as far ahead in those domains as we are today? So the future does take effort, and it does take people to sit down, think about it, and plan for it. So we have just a couple of images there now of how the, the digital kind of tsunami, that digital change, is so huge and immense now. So this is a paper from an IEEE journal four years ago. And they talked then about devices that have now become commonplace. You might even own some of the things that are listed there. Some of them never took off. Of course, you're going to have a couple of misses. 
but in all phases of our lives. So these are the less healthy things that happened during COVID. But of course, businesses had to respond to COVID too. So menus had to go online, ordering services had to go online. We, it was vital that we had pints delivered to the door during COVID. On the left, you'll see an autonomous um, van that delivers your dinner or your groceries in Houston, I think it is. So the, the pace of innovation and the pace of change with digital is just immense, and you all know that. Here we have, uh, and I don't know again how many of you are gadget lovers and might even own some of these already. We might work on our lending technology people to see if they'll get some of these into our libraries to see if they'll uh, let us borrow them and have a bit of fun with these, some of these devices like the AR and the VR headsets. I think Kira talked about them yesterday about trying out an Oculus headset. Put that on your to-do list for the summer. I certainly have a pair of smart glasses on my to-do list for the summer. If you look them up, Ray-Ban has a brand of them at the moment. They're very, very subtle. So you can wear them and you can go around and take pictures on holidays and they sound like great fun. Um, so whether it's for health, leisure or education, I think digital is pervasive. In education, the picture is the very same. There is no escaping digital. So students really, they're, they were bamboozled. They are, continue to be bamboozled. And I think that we might have taken it a little bit for granted in an analog world. Um, we, we deal with the same queries so often and over and over again that, you know, do, do we develop a degree of immunity to what's really happening? I know this room doesn't because you're all very tuned into student engagement. It's important that we retain that and particularly that we enhance it when we go back to on-campus learning in September, fully online, fully, well, as fully as we can be. But they are bamboozled by the array of skills and technologies that they're faced with when they join university. They didn't know what they didn't know, though, in March 2020. It would be very difficult for students to articulate exactly what it was that they wanted to be told about. So, so we're on the other side then, as the educators and the staff members. We know the tools, we know the technologies, we know how things will be assessed, taught, um, and delivered. So there is, again, that responsibility on us to impart that to the students incoming. The Educause Horizon report, some of you might, might know, it's... Um, it's published a couple of times a year, but the, the teaching and learning edition of it is very interesting for this year. The, it profiles key trends and emerging technologies in post-secondary education. And if you take the Educause report, the JISC Insights survey, and the Irish one, the index one, you'll have three very, very good sources to kind of parse some signals and some trends to inform library services into the next year or two. Okay, so going back then to the future doesn't just happen, it does require us to do something about it. Fortunately, and, and you all know this, we're in a very creative and innovative profession. You'll have heard plenty of examples yesterday, and there are plenty of examples at the back of the room in the poster session that talk about the innovations and the creativity that have gone on in the last two years. And it's not just the last two years, it's the last 102 years, and hopefully uh, long into the future. So the EU, the Irish government, and our universities are prioritizing digital upskilling in all of their strategies. So the digital education plan from the EU um, talks about four things. Now, as I call them out, you'll say, God, there must have been a librarian writing that, but bear with me. So they're talking about, they talk explicitly about prioritizing digital skills and competencies from an early age, so we can almost see our public library colleagues in that as well. They talk about digital literacy, including tackling disinformation. They talk about computing education and the importance of understanding of data intensive technologies like AI. The 10 year literary, uh, uh, 10 -year literacy strategy for Ireland came out less than a year ago, so last July, and that prioritizes more or less the same things. But one stark number from it, the strategy sets out to decrease the share of uh, adults in Ireland who are without basic digital skills, from 47%, so almost half, down to 20% in the lifetime of the strategy. Irish universities are prioritising digital in their strategic plans too. And the libraries are also playing their part in it, digital upskilling. Our study today is just one example of the hundreds of initiatives that have been undertaken in the country in the last 12 months. Two years. So, as I said, students didn't quite know what they wanted. We had the advantage of having access to the data in the background, and we were able to put a program together that addressed what we felt were the contemporary digital needs. 
So students did flock to these digital skills workshops at that point in time. They mightn't have been conscious of their lifelong need for digital upskilling or that they were the target of any of these EU or government or university strategies. What they needed really was academic survival skills. We saw a 1,000% increase in the registrations for the series compared to a year earlier. Now, a year earlier, we had offered it just before COVID, in person, in the library, and it was a completely different experience a year later. But online delivery of the, of the classes was not the only reason that people came to the classes. So we, we've interrogated, we, we did focus groups and we asked people, why did you come? Because we just couldn't understand the, the volume and the interest. So there were reasons other than just the online delivery. So while there was huge interest in it in the series, and we were delighted with it, of course, there were lessons learned. And I'm going to give you five sort of takeaways uh, about I suppose things to bear in mind if you're going to embark on you know, refreshing your skills program in your library or maybe even taking on a bit of a digital, um, a digital vinyl, if you like, to your, your series of workshops. It might seem obvious to say to you that you should teach students what they want and what they need to learn, but that's absolutely fundamental to the success of anything. If, you know, the programs that come under threat in your institutions will be the ones that don't have any interest in the CAO. Those will be the programs that are on the radar of whoever it is that cancels programs. Um, so finding out through the JISC report, the EDUCAUSE report, and maybe the Irish one, talking to your students, talking to your academics, having a look at the curriculum, seeing what's relevant, and talking to other Connell libraries. Talk to our colleagues in the UK and look at what's offered in the US in terms of digital upskilling. That's the first thing. The second, point, the second bit of advice is, Yes, of course, use social media. How else are you going to reach students, really, in a, in a, in a voluminous way? Um, but before you go near social media with any message, you've got to be crystal clear on what it is that you're offering. So you make sure that you have your title of your workshop nice and tight, your learning outcomes very clear, and then you go to social media with it. Don't go before that, please. We've learned the hard way. Um, if, like us, you, ha you, you bomb out in the first year, uh, and, and we did. We had 107 people at our workshops the first year that we offered it. 2,600 people signed up the following year. So if what happens to us happens to you, please don't give up. Do it anyway. Tweak it, refine it, have another go. Come back to the conference next year and tell us how it went, please. Um, again, going back to the academics, they have a, a vital role in so much of what goes on in our, our campus lives and in student engagement. Each of you knows at least one, I think, maybe two. Um, so when we did the focus groups as part of the research, the students told us that they came to the workshops because their lecturers told them to. So students don't go to their academic leaders usually to find help with technology and digital. They'll ask their friends, they'll go to YouTube, and now they were able to go to us, which is great. And the final thing is, now I don't know, I, I, I suspect there are a few YouTubers here from some of the talks we heard yesterday, and there's a poster back there about using Instagram for, for teaching as well. What I would say to you, and this is hopefully ringing in your ears now about the UDL principles, the multiple means of engagement, do use multiple formats for delivering your content. So whether it's a little short teaser video to entice people to come to your class, or that short video becomes a standalone learning resource of its own, please do use multiple formats. It doesn't take 25 minutes to learn every library skill. If it did, we'd never, ever, ever get finished teaching uh, those skills. So some things can be learned in a minute or two. So I think Niall O'Brien's examples in the earlier talk um, proved that, and, and the numbers speak for themselves there. So for two years then, the library led and ran this digital skills series. And we knew from the numbers and we knew from the interest that it did need to scale up it needed to grow, it needed to expand. So in the, there, was, there were three divisions involved in it, so library, IT, and the Centre for Transformative Learning all kind of almost parked our own jobs for a little while and did this three-week burst of digital skills. We couldn't continue to do it. The library just didn't have the capacity to continue to run it, and we certainly couldn't scale it up. So we, we do contribute content to it still, but the EDTL IUA project manager at UL now runs it. And of course, it underwent a refresh and a rebranding this year. It's now called the Level Up series. So just, I'll finish up by telling you some of the content that was offered on it this year. So writing essays within Vivo, who knew? Uh, 
evaluating sources using the CREP test, um, using Word to proof your, your, your document, the basics of podcasting, some digital well-being content, uh, Creative Commons licenses, it's just some new content added to it this year. So everything we do then is relevant at a particular point in time. Uh, the, juniors, the students who were due to, do, due to do their junior certs at the time that COVID arrived on our shores, they'll be coming to college in September. So they've spent over two years learning online. They've been introduced uh, to VLEs, LMSs, probably through Google Classroom or something like that. So we, wouldn't it be great to think that they were going to arrive in fully digitally equipped and ready to go, but sure they won't. They'll arrive into the weird and wonderful world of college and we'll hit them with Panopto and EndNote and all the funny things that, that, that they need to know and need to learn. So we shouldn't underestimate the transition and the huge change that will be required for them. So we're used to Zoom and Panopto and all the tools we now use. Your college will change its VLE or its LMS You'll get a new library website, you'll bring on new services, you'll change how things look, and all of your students will need to step through all of those changes with you as well. So be there for your students, like libraries always are. Refresh your programs and give it a lick of paint when you have the time and let that paint be digital. So really, I, I guess I should finish with a thank you to, the, to my co-authors, first of all, um, for the painful proofreading data gathering and so on. Thank you to the editors in the new review of Academic Librarianship for entertaining us in the first place. And uh, please do download it yourselves and have a read through it. Thanks everybody.